we must never allow the immigrants who came before who have decided to slam the door shut and not allow other people in to tell us that we are not Americans. And that includes Italians, Poles, Catholics, Jewish people, Jewish Americans, even black people. We cannot run that game on people. We need to understand that we are all in this together and that this is the only bastion of America, of democracy, of pluralism that we have in the world. We must never allow the rich to tell us that they run this country. We run it. Si agara, camina, está estamulada. Camina, ay mamita, camina, anda. Camina, sal un poquito para acá. Camina, sí. Let's talk about what what exactly is the Young Lords. The Young Lords was the first stateside Puerto Rican group, militant uh, socialist group, that advocated the for the independence of the island and self determination for all oppressed peoples. It had not happened before. All of the independence movements that had occurred before occurred in Puerto Rico. We decided to take Albizu Campos's um, philosophy and translate it to our people here. We were very influenced by Malcolm. We were very influenced by the Black Power movement, Stokely Carmichael and Rep Brown. We were very influenced by the Black Panthers. So we decided to take all of those elements, apply that to the objective conditions of our people, and begin to organize. I had started a political workshop. I could not just do poetry. I was in Queens College at the time, a political science major, and a philosophy maven. I loved philosophy. So I would take all of the concepts that I learned in Queens College and bring them to Harlem. Mm -hmm. I would bring up Rousseau, Fanon, um, uh, Nietzsche, uh, Plato, Aristotle, uh, Rap Brown, Stokely Carmichael, and Malcolm. We did all of that, and I'd be Sucampos, all rolled into a, into a ball. The ones who came were all the activists of the community at that time, people whose names are icons now. I noticed there was a smattering of Puerto Rican students. Now understand, at that time, we still had some division between the black and Puerto Rican community. We were together as a voting block, but we weren't really intimate. There was no uh, jugular or umbilical connection between the black and Puerto Rican community. I seem to be the living embodiment of that. Um, so. I became the guy, the go-to guy, when it came to black and Puerto Rican unity and that kind of stuff. But I was ensconced in the black community because I didn't feel that the Puerto Rican community was ready for my message. I didn't feel that they were militant enough. I didn't feel that they were ready to throw down, as we say. And what shifted? Because something shifted. So, well, what shifted was... What shifted was the murder of Malcolm X um, and the murder of King. That was it. For me, something happened. I came home from college, I was on the A train, and I was crying openly. I just couldn't stop crying. Here was the favorite uncle. I didn't agree with him. In fact, I disagreed with him on so many things. But why would they kill him? That transformed me into an active revolutionary. I mean, I wanted to enter armed struggle immediately. What I did is I went to the loft and this group of Puerto Ricans who had been coming up to me, cajoling me, wheedling me to join them in their struggle, a struggle that I had refused to enter because I felt they weren't ready for it, I joined. And it was called La Sociedad de Albizu Campos. It was a student group. And then it, and then it became the Young Lords. Then it became the Young Lords. We realized we were spending more time on the streets than we were in school. So I decided to leave school. Now that was a big move for me because I never thought I could be in college. Nobody in my family had ever graduated from college. Uh, and I went into the meeting one day and I said, let me explain to you the way I'm feeling. And I let it all out. They all were thinking the same thing and we all decided to leave college and uh, dedicate ourselves as full-time revolutionaries. And from that point on, I never looked back. We decided to form a leadership because my particular brand of political philosophy says there are three things that need to be done in order for revolution to take place. The first is ideology, what do you believe? We were socialists. Um, and we believed in Puerto Rican independence. The second was leadership. You have to have strong leadership. The myth that an organization can win or can even function without strong leadership um, is, is debilitating uh, and I think is what the United States wants us to believe in order to keep us from achieving victory in this country. And third, you need organization. 
you can't have revolution without those three components. We were clear about who we were in terms of ideological belief, but we weren't clear on leadership. And there was some jockeying for power within the group. I had just come in, so who the hell was I? But the difference between me and the others who were being uh, sought after for leadership was that I believed in physical confrontation. I did not believe that just shouting or doing rhetoric or armchair philosophizing was going to suffice. We had to go up on these guys. And if they came at us, we had to fight back. What that meant was that some of us would get hurt, and some of them would get hurt, but some of us would die. And I was prepared for that. That is what changed the tide for me. So they elected me leader, chairman, if you will. I didn't know what it entailed. If I had known what it meant, I probably wouldn't have done it. Because what it means is that this, the target is on your back now. And as you said that, I'm thinking of when you guys took over the church. Yes. And you got your ass beat. Oh, badly. We were trying to put together a breakfast program. It was the most successful of the Black Panthers programs because it won the hearts over of middle class black people who thought that they were thugs. Once you see your children being fed, once you see men, bearded men, muscular men and women, sitting down and giving them eggs and giving them farina and giving them grits and giving them orange juice and bread, we already knew that without a good breakfast, without good nutrition, kids would sleep in the middle of the morning. They just would fall out. We saw this and we, we asked nurses uh, what the problem was and they said it's nutrition. We decided to initiate this program. The only place we could find was the First Spanish Methodist Church, which used to be right near your school, Command de Shea, right. across the street from it, on 111th and Lexington. We went to the church for seven weeks, uh, for six weeks. On the seventh week, I happened to come back from Louisiana with Rep. Brown, and they were saying, we don't know what to do. I said, let's take it. Let's just take it. We had gone into the church on the seventh week, and I stood up because Testimonial Sunday, which is a ritual among Protestant churches, um, allows you to get up and talk about what the Lord has done for you. So I got up and I said, I praise God for having allowed me to survive jail, to come out to serve my people. What I would, I would love to continue serving my people by serving the kids in this church, breakfast. As soon as I got up within five minutes of my speaking and walking toward the center of the church down the middle aisle, 10 undercover guys got up and began to pummel me with their nightsticks. After that, I hit one. Uh, there were five of them on me. The other five had gone to the back of the church to get the other 13 young lords who were under the pews. So um, as soon as they started hitting me, 20 uniformed officers came in. It was one of the worst beatings I've ever received. Uh, and my mother used to beat me well. But this was, I saw the light. The light kept on telling me, why she don't you? She prepped you for that. She beating. prepped me for that one. <laughs> the light kept on telling me, why don't you just go to sleep? Just let it go. Um, we should tell your viewers that if you ever hear that light, don't obey it because it means death is waiting for you right there, right at the door. And I refused to, uh, to go to sleep, though I wanted to so badly. So they broke my arm in two places. They gave me all kinds of stitches in the head. The blood was flowing so freely that I was slipping on it. Mm. It was like a Fellini movie. And as they were beating me, they were singing Onward Christian Soldiers. Shows you how brainwashed they were. So that was the beginning. We're beaten up. They put us in court, they let us, uh, my arm was killing me. Three days I had no medical attention, which is what got us off because the judge asked the police, how can, according to New York law, you have to treat someone immediately? She said, this young man, why are you holding your hand aloft like that? I said, because they broke it. She says, have you checked his arm out? Mm -hmm. The cop said, well, we didn't have the time. She said, case dismissed. You guys are ridiculous. And I said, thank you so much, Johnny. She said, well, thank me, thank them. Their stupidity is what, what caused me to let you go. We met again, we're out now free, and they said, what do we do? I said, now let's take it. Mm. Now let's take it. They, they, they threw the first glove, they threw the gauntlet down, let's, let's accept it. Within the next week, we rested, we bought chains, locks, everything from every hardware store in Harlem. The one on 106th Street, the one on 116th Street. We didn't want them to know that we were doing this, so we would go in as couples, mm -hmm. and they thought we had buildings that we had to protect. We bought all of that stuff, and that two Sundays after, we took the church. And we, we told people, those who want to leave can leave. 50% of the church stayed in because they were so pissed off at the minister who had beaten us in the church. Um, for 11 days, we held the greatest services in New York. God was in that church. Everyone came. Bette Midler came. 
Jane Fonda came. Donald Sutherland came. Bud Schulberg came. Elia Kazan came. Pete Hamill came. Breslin came. All of the great reporters came. And of course, some of the great reporters in New York. J.J. Gonzalez and Gloria Rojas and great people. And out of that, we developed a media presence. Um, 11 days later, we were let out, chanting, Que viva Puerto Rico Libre. And the next job, the next job, we figured, what do we do next? We had learned that uh, a woman uh, had gone in for a late-term abortion and they had killed her. Or, or rather, she died. Lincoln Hospital had the reputation of being a ghetto municipal hospital. Or Roach Motel. You go in, but you, you never come, come out. out. Mm. So... As soon as I heard it, I, I knew we had to take it. Mm -hmm. We were occupation specialists at this point. We knew how to take a church. We knew what we were doing. So uh, we thought about it. Uh, there were five central committee members, and some were afraid that the onus of failure would be on us because if somebody died while we were there, and people die in hospitals, that we would be blamed for it. I said, then let's take something that's as important to the hospital without taking over the hospital proper. Right. There was an 11-story nurse's residence that was key to their functioning because the, the nurses had to come back and forth. We took over the nurse's residence and made sure that we kept tabs on the hospital. As it turns out, Lincoln Hospital was the most underfunded of all the hospitals. It was horrible. They were doing reports on it mm. every other month on how bad this hospital was. So we decided to take it. Now, taking it means we had to train. And one of the things that I'm proud of, I made sure that our guys, our men and women, because there were men and women in it, were totally physically and mentally prepared for battle. Uh, we could run for maybe from 112th to 125th with no problem at breakneck speed. And that was pretty good. The time came for us to take the hospital over. We had been already organizing. There were groups outside of us that were organizing. We get in a truck, about 20 of us, and when that door opened in the mor on the morning, early in the morning, uh, it was dark out, they were in shock. The guards were in shock, the security guards. One guy tried to give us a hard time, but we were so uh, adept at karate, particularly um, Shotokan um, that, and Taekwondo, that we were able to, one guy was, gave him a sidekick that almost knocked him out, and we went in. We also had nunchakas. Went into the hospital and ran, we secured the hospital, it's 11 stories, we secured the hospital in seven minutes. We uh, occupied it in seven minutes, secured it, meaning that all exits and exits were completely manned. We did it in 15 minutes. But we took the hospital. At that point, the city said, we, we were very lenient with you with the People's Church. We, call, we renamed it the People's Church. This is taking over city property. I have never seen a, a group, a convoy of armored vehicles before in my life. For me, this was war. They had an APC, an armored personnel carrier. They had stoner assault guns, which can go through three feet of concrete. We, we already knew about these things, but we didn't know that the cops had them. This is army issue. Mm -hmm. And they came in and tried to negotiate and told us, well, you know, if we leave, the negotiator said, if we leave... There's going to be blood. I said, it's going to be on your hands because we're not leaving. Well, needless to say, we had already had an escape route. Um, there was an underground tunnel that led to the streets that would have mm. been constructed by the abolitionists in the 1850s mm. to help slaves. Wow. In, in New 18, York. In New York. Wow. And when they came in, they did rush the hospital. Uh, they broke the glass. They broke, I mean, it was horrendous what they did to that hospital. We were already escaping and we got out. That was a victory for us. Why was it a victory? A, we demanded a Puerto Rican administrator for Lincoln Hospital. We demanded a patient's uh, bill of rights. Mm -hmm. And we demanded, demanded a new hospital. All of those were achieved. Um, a couple of years ago, there were a few exhibits on the Young Lords, um, three that I went to see in New York. Uh, one on the Lower East Side, one in Museo del Barrio, and I believe the other one was at, in the Bronx. Yes. What I found really perplexing was that you were not included in any of them. Well, first of all, I should explain that there was a concerted effort to remove me from the history of the Young Lords. Everything that they consider um, that you would see as a signature piece that defines the Young Lords was done during the time I was chairman. It was after that that nothing took place. 
Um, and they turned on each other and started beating each other up. And um, so, and, and to be transparent, you were kicked out of the I was Young Lords out. for because, male chauvinism. For male chauvinism, and because and, you had an affair. I had an affair you with were a married, woman, and I was and, married. To but let me explain to you what was happening at the time. The women's faction had developed quite a strength within the party. Cointel Pro, which is the government program, had used the women's issue to divide us. They began to have women and men in there who were agreeing that women should. Take part because in the Central we were committee. also coming into the feminist, the feminist movement. Thing. That's right. So yeah. they use that. Um, I'm convinced that there are still elements within the Young Lords who are agents who who have not been caught. This country never wants Puerto Ricans to develop a revolutionary status and have an organization that stands for something. My feeling is that they get that in getting rid of me and in, in not telling the public the truth, they will be able to control the narrative. And I'm convinced that this is as much a plot on the part of the uh, Cointel Pro and the government as everyone else. Do you have any final thoughts regarding the revision stuff that has taken place with the Young Lords? The first thought I have is that we can never underestimate this government's ability to destroy and destruct a revolutionary progressive organization. They will do everything they can. They'll pay, they'll co-opt, uh, they will blackmail and they will kill. Number two, we must never forget that reconciliation has to be the first order of business. The young lords have not done that. There has to be a sense that we have messed up. So who's going to do this? Well, I've, tried, I've called them. I wrote to one of them, and I said, if there's not going to be a reconciliation, I don't want to be part of the 50th. I'd rather avoid it. Now, so that's the other thing. We need to reconcile. Right, so, so someone's got to be the force to bring that. I promise you and I promise your audience that I will do my best to talk to all of them because I can't talk to all of them. There's still an enormous amount of anger directed at me. Um, I'm still called a male chauvinist. Um, and you should talk to my children because they would say that's the craziest thing they've ever heard of. Um, and several of my relationships uh, in the past and my current one um, would say he's a bit strange, but he's not. He's not abusive, and I don't know where that's coming from. So he's spoiled. He, I'm spoiled. I am <laughs> by her. I also believe that, as a rule, those who are in charge of the narrative today um, begin to understand that it was both people who made it possible, men and women and children, by the way. Um, a lot of our children suffered as a result of our revolutionary activity. I'm still undergoing, and I'm pretty sure many of my comrades, men and women, are going to PTSD. Um, whether it's alcoholism, drug addiction, violence, whatever, they're still going through it. In order to help, we have to heal first ourselves. Uh, thirdly, we have to understand as a nation, if you haven't developed an independent spirit and an independent country, you're never going to be whole. What is the call to action for young people who are in this country now from Puerto Rico, what can we say to them, as well as Latinos who are here from other countries, to start to take their power back? How can we help them, uh, give them tools to be more active in their community, more politically um, savvy? We need to reignite that sense of community, that sense of a family, if you will. I think that young people are ready for it. I think there's a whole new movement toward Afro-Latinidad, mm -hmm. Afro-Hispanidad, and it must not be bourgeois. It has to be militant. One of the problems we've had is that we like to be progressive but not revolutionary. Socialism is a viable economic modality. We have to look at that seriously. Already Bernie Sanders is doing it. Miss Ocasio is doing it. We need to look at it because capitalism is dying. It's over for this empire. And we have to be part of the new move. So youth are ready. We have to read. We have to travel. We have to write. Um, and that doesn't mean that if the person speaks well, they're not Puerto Rican. It doesn't mean also mean, doesn't also mean that if the person has an accent that they're not a part of the American fabric. The other thing that I think we need to instill through our educational policies and through culture is that this is our country. It's not their country. It's our country. We built this bad boy. And we can never forget the history of colonization. We built it.
Immigrants built it. Immigrants built it. Mm -hmm. um, and we must never allow the immigrants who came before who have decided to slam the door shut and not allow other people in to tell us that we are not Americans. And that includes Italians, Poles, Catholics, Jewish people, Jewish Americans, even black people. We cannot run that game on people. We need to understand that we are all in this together and that this is the only bastion of, America, of democracy a plural that we have in the world. We must never allow the rich to tell us that they run this country. We run it. 